Today is November the 30th, 2018. My name is Tanya Fincham. I'm with Oklahoma State University. Today I'm in Walters, Oklahoma to speak with Ron Hilliard. And this is part of our Oklahoma's Conservation Heritage Oral History Project, which is a collaboration between Oklahoma State University, the uh, Natural Resources Conservation Services, and the new, newly formed Oklahoma Conservation Historical Society. So, thank you for coming. Great, great. I just, just you know, good to be back to Oklahoma because I retired six years ago, and it's really the first time I've been back. I guess I should say you were the state conservationist for Oklahoma from 2006 to 2013. Correct. Correct. Okay. So, let's just back up a little bit and start with when and where you were born. Okay, I was born in a little town of Haskell, Texas, which is about 60 miles north of Abilene. It's a uh, farming community, farming ranching community. Uh, my granddad settled there in 1905. Um, the whole family was raised there. They come from uh, Tennessee and moved to Texas and then ended up in that, that part of the country. And I uh, raised seven kids on a 60-acre homestead wow. and farmed with mules until 1963 when he passed away. So he did all of his farming. He's kind of a unique character in that part of the world because he used to ride and take his wagon to town, even in the 50s and 60s, to, and then he got a 28 Model A Ford that he drove then. I think about 63 <laughs> there were tractors. Oh yes. He just chose not to have one. He chose not to have one. That was the way he was raised. And so I, I spent a lot of my summers, in fact, as soon as school was out, I'd spend my summers living on the farm with them. And we did everything by hand. I'm talking about, they had no running water, no no outdoor facilities. Uh, my, mother, my grandmother had a gasoline washing machine and uh, she made her own lye soap. We uh, we killed her own beef and hogs and rendered everything. And uh, we cut hay by hand. We harvested milo, maize, if you want to call it that, by hand uh, with a uh, goose uh, gooseneck knife. And uh, we'd haul it in and put it up in the loft of the barn and then we had to, we'd thrash it out by hand because it was a, an open pollinated line of milo and uh, we'd plant that the next year. That was the feed it used and fed the chickens and things with that. Wow, what, a, what an education <laughs> though, early. Oh, it was, it was great. I mean, I, I got to list some things that a lot of people never even knew anything about. Uh, even got to drive the, uh, the wagon that he drove to, to West Texas, <clears throat> you know, from Tennessee over there. Wow. So, and he had mules. He had mules. He had, had a team of mules. Do you remember their names? Um, oh gosh, Sadie and oh, I can't remember what the other one was. Sadie, I remember one. Okay. We had a had male and female. And uh, gosh, I, 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 yeah, I just went blank. That's okay. Yeah. And did you have siblings? Yes. Um, we had uh, two sisters and a brother. I'm the oldest of the bunch. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, my dad, my dad met my mother in San Diego when he was in the Navy, and uh, so they married. Uh, coming back to Texas after he mustered out of the Navy in 1946, and headed to back, and they made it for Yuma, Arizona. Got married on the way back to Texas. <laughs> kind of an eloped, you know, marriage thing. Yeah. So yeah. she wasn't from Oklahoma, or no? She's from Minneapolis. Oh. Grew up in Minneapolis. Uh, is a is an orphan. Her mother passed away about a year after she was born. Mm. So but their whole family of seven, which were farmers and uh, dairymen up there too, uh, and then she ended up moving out there with her sister to California, and that's how she met my dad. So during the war time. <clears throat> yes. So what year were you born? I was born forty eight. Forty eight. So. Pretty soon after they got back, right. back to Texas. Right. Well, tell us a little bit about what he did. Well, my dad, uh, like I say, after he came back from the Navy, he spent most of his time as a ranch foreman okay. and uh, did uh, working on some farms and ranches around the high school where he was born. He's the only one that was born, raised, and stayed there for his whole life, except for his uh, stint in the Navy. He uh, did that, and then he went to back to the uh, GI school and you know got his education because he, he got out to the school in 11th grade because back when he was growing up people growing up on a the farm they spent their time harvesting crops like right now mm -hmm. they we pulled our cotton and we pulled cotton until I got to high school in 1966 we didn't have tractor to pull you know to do it with and so we had to pull cotton so they missed all the school so he could only go to school from 
the second semester. So it took him two years to get a grade level. So he made it to 11th grade to give up and then he joined the Navy. And so uh, only two of his uh, brothers and sisters had graduated from high school. It's different times. Wasn't it's different it? times. Mm -hmm. Different times. Because that you know the whole family worked. That's how that's how it was put together. Yeah. And then my dad went to work in the. Uh, he got uh, into the hardware furniture business with a cut of some guys and stayed there for 25 years as the manager. And then they closed down the business and he went to work for the uh, Department of uh, Transportation for Texas and spent another 20 years with them and retired. Uh -huh. But he maintained the farm uh, for that whole time. So. With help from children and oh, yes. other sources. Yeah. That was that was our deal. Is uh, we all pull cotton, and we started like the first of September. We all pull cotton, and uh, so you start, got us school too. No, we do that after school. Okay. Uh, my mother and dad would work in the fields a lot of times while we were in school, and uh, I loved to cook and learn to cook because my mother'd leave a menu out for my sister and I, and we'd have the dinner cooked when they come in at night. Oh. Or we call supper, you know, so. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was neat, too, to learn how to do that sort of thing. You, you, you ran the gamut. We did, yeah. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun, and like I say, we spent a lot of time in the fields pulling cotton ourselves, and then us kids, if we had an opportunity, uh, like in this year where there's cottons, you know, kind of uh, hit and miss, some of the cotton crops are good, some of them are not, uh, back before they had the insurance and everything, mm -hmm. the guys would just, you know, decide not to pull it. They would give it to us if we wanted to pull it. So we'd go pull it as kids to get a remnant bale, you know, not a full 500-pound uh, bale. We'd get a remnant bale and we'd take that money to buy our Christmas with. So, yeah, my, my brother and, and my sister, this, my little sister was too young. She's 10 years younger, so she couldn't do that. So the three of us would go out and pull and make enough money to buy our Christmas with. Oh, that's a, that's a neat memory too. <laughs> it yes. is, it is. Well, this may be a dumb question. Would they pay you along through the year when you're doing all these chores, or that was just contributing to the family's we had, we survival? Had, we had no um, uh, allowance. Uh, we were just expected to work. But in uh, in that regard, too, we uh, I raised cattle, and we had a farrowing operation, you no know, pigs. So I had my own set of hosting cows, and then I'd go to the auction and buy baby calves that come from the dairy, you know, because as soon as the calves born, they take it off because they want the milk production. So I'd buy the calves and I'd have three, four calves on my cows, you know, to raise calves and it's, you know, to sell those for that. And then that's what I bought my first car with and everything like that, so. Learning business is on the way too. Yes, like Managing money Correct. and all that. Yeah, that's what got me interested in the agricultural side of it, so. I'm thinking, when was your first bank account? Probably when you were just a little guy. Uh, yes, it was, and you know, and it's kind of surprising. I'll just, uh, you know, uh, going forward a little bit. <clears throat> when I got to, was in high school, uh, I met the current wife, the only wife, and uh, we got engaged. And I went to Abilene. She and I went to Abilene, and uh, we were juniors. Then there between our junior and senior year, went to Zales Jewelers and bought the wedding. And we bought the wedding set, you know, it's a man's ring and, you know, the two-piece uh, for the lady. Mm -hmm. uh, and I put it on credit. I went back home. My dad said, where in the world did you get that? How did you get credit? Well, with him working at the hardware and furniture store, I used to mow yards in the summertime. And they, I'd buy a lawnmower for thirty nine ninety five for, you know, push mower and everything. And he would uh, put it on credit. And so I paid it out so much a week. And so I'd established a credit there, and when I told the hell they had credit there, they, they did it. And so, you know, at 16, 17, I already had charge accounts around. <laughs> and then we got married between our, uh, uh, after the first year in college, we got married, so. Where did you go to college? I started out at Cisco Junior College. Um, like I say, <clears throat> my family wasn't that well off, so. We didn't have, Daddy didn't have a whole lot of fun. He said, I can't pay you to go to school. I can't afford for you to go to school. So what I'll do is uh, we'll get you a national defense loan. So, you know, student loan. So we got one and went to Cisco and I kept it for the first semester and I found out that's not the way to go. So I just turned it back and started working cattle sales and making money and paid my way through. And my mom and dad never needed to pay anymore because, you know, he couldn't afford it and what he was doing with, you know, three other kids at home. 
So that's yeah. the way I did it. I went to Cisco and then uh, graduated from there, got an associate's degree from Cisco Junior College, and then went on up to Texas Tech University. At that time, it was Texas Technological College. Okay. And uh, when I graduated in 1970, I had a choice of graduating as Tech Texas Technological College or Texas Tech University. You could be the last one of that school or the first one of the university. So I took the Texas Tech University okay. to be the first. Well, no, yes. <laughs> what was your major? I was the. Uh, that was one of my my goals was to be an ag ed teacher. I wanted oh. to teach ag ed, and I told the uh, teacher there at Haskell High School where I was at I was going to take his job from him. He said, "Well, I'll wait for you." But he retired a year before I got out of school, and uh, so I got my <clears throat> teaching certificate in ag ed. And when I got out, I tried to find a job, <clears throat> but in 1969, uh, they had the draft program. And so I had a lump number that was below 200, and you could not back then. And it was uh, before they got all of the veterans preferences and all this other stuff, you know, as far as people. Uh, you could not get a job. If you had a low draft number, nobody would hire you. Hmm. Because then if you got hired, you're going to have to get drafted and be gone. So. I couldn't get a job, so I went ahead and got in, got in the military at that time. <clears throat> so, Well, let's back up before we get to that. In high school, were you in FFA or 4-H? Or... I was in FFA. FFA. In, in our school in high school, they got four years, and most schools they only have three. We had Ag 1, Ag 2, Ag 3, and Ag 4. So I went all the way through that. About how many were in your graduating class? We had 48 in a graduating class. Oh, that's... Yeah. I was in the middle of the road. Number 24. <laughs> was, At least you were in the road, right? <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was in the road. I was not the, the most studious person. You know, I was, uh, uh, in fact, I played football until I was a sophomore. And my dad pulled up to the practice field one day and rode down the window and did this to me. And I went over there and he said, you got a choice of playing football, raising cows and pigs, and you need to make, make up your mind. And I said, what do I need to know? He said, right now. So I walked to the coach and I said, Coach, I quit. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I didn't see a big future, you know, of a collegiate future or anything like that in football. So I knew what the cattle and the pigs were doing for me. And uh, instead of being out there beating my head and being a tackling dummy, you know, I decided to go ahead and give up the football. And he let it be your decision. Yeah, yeah within a split second. <laughs> 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 he, my dad was uh, pretty frank. There was no beating around the bush. Well, did you have a favorite subject in high school? You know, I was I was really intrigued with math. I, I love math, <clears throat> and it's uh, that was probably my strong suit. I, I probably should have pursued that more, but uh, back then, uh, I'll be honest with you, the counselors that like my kids had and, and my sisters and brothers had after I left, I had a uh, Football coach is my counselor. Bring in, say, hey, Ron, what are you going to do? I'm going to college. Oh, that's great. Check it off. That's the only counseling you got. So you had no direction of what to do. Uh, I never took chemistry in high school. So when I went to college, and if you're in the College of Ag, you got two two semesters of or inorganic and one semester of organic, and it almost killed me. <laughs> I didn't even know, you know what the periodic tables were until I got into the classroom. But uh, I made it through uh, it was a very big learning curve, but the counseling that kids get now today is so much better. So much better. A yeah. lot of choices, too, too lot, many sometimes. Though. It is. And my kids went through that. Uh, uh, both of them told me what they was going to do, and they said they want to go here, and the counselor said, you ain't got the grades for it. You're not going to get to You know, they knew. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I say, my dad was very embarrassed when I went to Cisco instead of going straight to a major university. He went to a junior college first. And, Kind of hurt him, but uh, you know, because all the other kids were going to Texas Tech, Texas A and M, OSU, OU, you know, all over the country, and, or, or the Air Force Academy. And Ron's going to Cisco Junior College. He kind of do it under his breath. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm assuming you were the first generation to go to college, though, because you're. you're I am. I, out of my mother and dad's family, I'm the first one to to get a bachelor's and the first one to get a master's degree. And then I worked toward a PhD, but never to get to finish it, so. 
Well, once you got into Texas Tech, he would just say then that my, oh, son, my was, son's at Texas Tech. <laughs> yeah, he was, he was very, very pleased with that. Okay. So. <laughs> so, so once you didn't get your teaching gig, what did you do? Well, I moved back to, and started farming with my father-in-law. And uh, because I knew I was going to get drafted, or I was going to, and I ended up joining, I ended up joining the in the uh, Texas Army National Guard, uh, and I thought that was just going to be a, you know, a way to get my military obligation out of the way and uh, to bring it forward. I spent 34 years after I got back in the reserve program and retired out of that uh, in the military. So it was something I didn't want to do, but it ended up being fun to do. Uh, had opportunities to go to officer candidate school and get my commission and that. So, but I spent the time farming with my father-in-law until I went to the military. And when I come back, uh, well, they gave me the opportunity when I was in uh, in basic training, and everything, to go to OCS, get, send me to school for my master's program, and spend some extra time. And I went had wife and kid at home, so I wanted to get back. So I went back and then enrolled in graduate school and then went to work uh, full time. Uh, I spent time as a plant breeder with Texas A&M uh, system in the, doing the Milo research, grain sorghum research. And then I went to be a full time uh, production agronomist in a, a grain sorghum company. Hmm. And so I did that until uh, SCS come along. <laughs> so your master's is from Texas A&M? Texas, no, Texas Tech. Tech. Texas Tech. I did some work at A&M because I went and got my ornamental horticulture certification because I was certified to teach ornamental horticulture in the school system. You're covering all your bases. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking for a job, you know, anything I could get. What year did you get your master's? I finally finished in 74 because I worked. Pretty quick. Yeah, I, I was trying to work and I'd go to school at night and then whenever I get off because I was working full time. So I had it set up as an MS, but then whenever I got into full time, I couldn't do the research. So I went ahead and picked up a master's in education with a minor in range in my life. So it worked. It still says master's. <laughs> <laughs> so before we get into conservation, had you learned anything conservation wise from your dad's farm and your in laws' farms before you get into it yourself? <sighs> A little bit. Uh, I never did understand until I went to work in at CS. Uh, my dad would go to the local office and go to the DC there, and he would get the David White instrument and the Philadelphia rods, and we'd go out and lay off some contours. I couldn't figure out what in the world he was doing. I had no idea. He never did explain it. But like I say, a guy that's 11th grade education, my dad was a very sharp person for that. I mean, he could lay out things like that. He'd lay out his own terraces or his, his contour lines and uh, do that. So that kind of gave me a background of what was going on. When I went to work, I thought, oh, now I know what's going on here. <laughs> but uh, we, uh, he did a lot, he still did a lot of rotation. My, my father-in-law, when I worked for him on the farm, we did a, we had a, he had like a thousand acres of land. He'd put a third in cotton, a third in grain, and uh, then he'd lay out a third. So he always rotated it around, and that was before it was basically cool to do that. Oh, so you had some of that too. Then. We did. Yeah. We did. Good background. It was very good. It, it kind of gave me the, you know, the urge to do something more. You know, stay in the agricultural side. Well then, so how did you end up with the SCS? <clears throat> I was working as a, like I said, working as a seed company there in uh, in Crosbyton, Texas, which is outside of Lubbock, <clears throat> up on the High Plains. And the local DC there, Silas Flanoy in Crosbyton, Texas, I went by to see him because we were, we, we saw these guys go by all the time, you know, working, and I was working in the fields uh, with the people on the combines and planting and everything else, you know, for the whole gamut. I did the contracting, supervised planting, supervised the growing and then harvesting and then all that stuff. And he said, we got some openings in the SCS. You ought to look at the applying for those. So with a master's degree, you should, you should get, you know, you start out as a GS7. I thought, man, that's money. Because uh -huh. uh, I knew what they was paying compared to what I was getting. <clears throat> so I put my name into the hat and <clears throat> I got uh, called. But back then you had to keep your registration up on a yearly basis <clears throat> for the, in the federal system, keep your 
stay active on the roads, you know, for, and I'd let a year lapse, and so I had to go reapply. And by the time it reapplied, they'd closed the register again. Well, two years later, it opened up again, and so I got hired on and <clears throat> went to work as a range con in uh, Bastrop, Texas. And that would have been what year? 1976. 76. So you mean <coughs> you took a civil service <coughs> exam? Is that what you mean, getting ready? Well, you didn't have to take it. You, you just you filled out the application. It was like, I don't know, it seemed like it's like four or five pages, you know, the application that you sent in. You had to send it to Salt Lake City, and then they evaluate it and give you a score. Okay. And you had to have a certain score in order to get hired, so... Yeah. That comes from someone just driving by telling you you ought to, you ought to apply. <clears throat> well, like I say, we, it's a small town, you know, it was like, mm -hmm. what, 3,000 people in that town, so we knew everybody. And Silas knew me because we, we went we went to the same, you know, the same community, the church, and, and he said, hey, we need, we're needing people. And he just picked me out of a crowd, basically. <laughs> so it was completely different than what I was, <clears throat> I was doing, because like I say, Grain sorghum research and breeding of grain sorghum for hybrid hybridization was uh, the thing I was doing at that time and going into range, but which was range was my big field because I'm a big range plants buff and you know cattle and stuff like that, so it all fit. And where was your first office? Bastrop, Texas, which is east of Austin, Texas. Bastrop. Bastrop. <clears throat> B a s s. B a s t r o p. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and how long were you there? Of uh, 76 to 77, I stayed there a year. One year. And then they moved me to Lockhart, Texas, which is 35 miles away. Almost didn't get my uh, move paid for because it was uh, right on the edge of the, where they would pay for a move and wouldn't pay for a move. So I went to Lockhart, Texas as a GS9, got my GS9 there, and stayed there until, uh, two, let's see, it was 19, 1979. Uh, I had the uh, opportunity to apply for a DC job, mm -hmm. and my district conservation said, "You ain't got enough time, Ron. Said, They're not going to hire you." <clears throat> well, I put my application in the mail, and it was so so funny, is my wife was working in, in the law office, and I'd go by and pick her up every day after work, and go by and drop her mail and then my mail, <clears throat> and I said, "We just applied for Odessa, Texas, and if you've never been to Odessa, that's out in the Permian Basin, out in you know a very arid." West Texas area. And she almost tore the mailbox off the deal to get the letter out, but she said, well, you won't get it. <clears throat> Two weeks later, I get a call and say, we want you to be the district conservationist in Odessa, Texas. So, uh -oh. <laughs> November, November of 79, which is kind of odd. November 79, I go to Odessa. November of 06, you know, come to Oklahoma, and, and here we are in November, we're talking this. So, November has a a significant uh, month. A significant month, yes, for things happening to me. <laughs> but anyway, I went out there as a district conservationist uh, in 1979. My wife said, we're not moving for a while. So I stayed there as a DC until 1995. A long time. And then went to the area office as a program specialist. So, so during that time, you went, went from a <clears throat> G9 to... I went from a GS7 in Bastrop, GS9 in Lockhart, to a GS11 in just in uh, to, to for a DC. For a DC, and then when I went to the area office, I got GS12 out of that. Well, along the way, did you have a mentor at the various places that you learned any particular thing from? You know, the the best mentors I had at the first field office level in, in Bastrop and Lockhart were the technicians, the conservation technicians. And every office will tell you if you want to know what's going on in the office, talk to the technician. Uh, the other people in the office may think they know what's going on, but the technician is the one that actually spends more time in the field, you know, working directly with the people. And so the technicians is the one that give me most of the training. That's where I learn most of my uh, do's and don'ts and some of the things you're not supposed to do, <laughs> you know, and some of the things you can get away with, if you want to call it that. Uh, and then when I moved to Odessa, uh, had a DC that lived that was in adjoining county. <clears throat> he kind of took me under my wing because I was brand spanking new DC, you know, just had no idea what fix to go on. And they threw me into a area of West Texas of uh, conservation programs I'd never seen before. Mm -hmm. And so he mentored me through that. And uh, I'll make a reference to this. He passed away just uh, last, this first September of this year. Mm -hmm. And from that day until September, we talked on basically a monthly basis and uh, continue to uh, 
he mentored me even through my, my all my moves and as I went up the ladder. What were some of the lessons you, you think you learned from him in particular? Uh, his his always and never never did he ever change his uh, I'd say, Dick, I'm fixing to move here. Hilliard, don't you ever forget where you come from. Meaning, you know, don't forget the other people. And that was his deal. Hilliard, don't you ever forget where you come from. And it, that stuck with me uh, all that time. He said uh, too many people, as they go up, just kind of step on people and forget what happened. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he was, he retired in 1986. Uh, is the district conservationist, but from that time, I mean, I, I still drew on him for for all kinds of advice and knowledge. Twenty or thirty more years. Huh? Exactly. Yeah. What was his name? Do you want to Do you want to say? It was uh, Richard Hagelstein. He went by Dick, mm -hmm. and uh, like I say, he passed away. I saw him uh, February, <clears throat> not this year, but last year of seventeen. I went by and drove out to Midland and visited with him in his house and we talked and hugged and everything like that. And like I say, uh, he called me son, I called him dad. And uh, that's that's kind of the relationship we had. But uh, and like I say, I don't get to talk to him now, so it's kind of sad that he passed on. But he's 89 years old, so right. yeah, had a long life. Well, what were some of the projects you did there as a DC? Some of the things going on during the time. in that part of the world being the ranching country that it was i had uh, two counties which comprised about a million ninety four thousand acres is what was in those two counties oh. 96 percent of that was rangeland so it was all mainly cattle ranching we had uh, 1500 acres of cropland and it was all pecan orchards yeah. and then the rest of it was uh, uh, metropolitan area of, of Odessa, Texas and Crane, Texas. Our biggest projects were removing the mesquite uh, brush that was on infesting, uh, root plowing and reseeding, and then doing grazing systems and fencing and watering. Uh, watering was a big issue in that part of the world because um, the soil would support what we call tanks, in RCS calls ponds, we grew up as tanks. Okay. Um, it wouldn't support, it wouldn't hold water, so we had to pipeline everything and put uh, water troughs in for the cattle. So there's miles and miles we'd run, I mean hundreds of miles of pipeline just to water cattle so we could get them dispersed and get the grazing system done. Were they cost share type programs for the farmers? <clears throat> most, of, most of them were uh, because we had the Great Plains Conservation Program at that time. Okay. And, uh, most of them were cost shared. We had a few programs through the, back then, the ASCS office, the ANA program, you know, on an annual basis. And they did mainly pipelines and water storages on a limited basis. If, if they couldn't get something through us, they'd go through them. And we had the technical responsibility to install those even though they come through the uh, ASCS office at that time. Did, was it like competition or was there plenty of whoever wanted them can get can get them? No, it was uh, it was very competitive because we had a limited amount of funds. Okay. And uh, the other thing was is that Great Plains Conservation Program at that time, you could have a contract and turn around and have a second contract, but then you had to wait. Uh, I think it was ten years before you could get another contract. And so a lot of these guys would use their first contract, their second contract, and then wait out the 10 years so they could get another contract. Because funds were, you know, pretty limited until they did away with the program. And the, the main thing about the Great Plains program, it was a whole ranch. So if you had a 20, you had a, at that time it was $25,000 cost share is all you had. But you did a plan on the whole ranch. And some of these ranches were 100 sections, you know, 64,000 acres. You might only get to treat a small portion of it, but the contract encompassed the whole ranch. So you had grazing systems and everything, so they had to, to meet the criteria that we had set up in the conservation plan on the whole ranch in order to get that one small amount of money, 25000 mm -hmm. And then they went up to 35000 to get, you know, for the cost share assistance. So. About how long would it take to develop a plan like that? Oh gosh, <clears throat> some of those would take weeks. Uh, 
I mean, you could spend to do the range sites uh, assessments and things. We would get together a lot of times as range cons and like. Uh, for instance, to have a hundred thousand acre ranch, we might bring four or five range cons in, and we'd work two or three days just doing range uh, range inventories to to see what you know the uh, makeup of the range condition classes were, and then put that all together in a format, and then leave it with the poor DC to have to sort through and you know figure it up. So it might take you, you know. It could take you a month in order to get some of these ranches all worked up because you had to, and we had to do maps. At that time, we had a cartographic center in Fort Worth, and so we'd send and they have to do a mosaic, which took more time because it takes so many. You know, you send your maps in, and they'd do a mosaic of it, and you get it back. Well, it might be a month before you get a map back or later, more. And so, and then you had to <clears throat> do all the drawing on it, you know, with your pediograph pens and all that stuff, and everything had to be exactly right because it went to the area office to be checked. And if you had a line with an X missing, you know, a line with this one slash mark, meaning it was a planned fence, it had an X on it, meaning it was a fence already existing. And everything as far as the annotation on the maps had to be corrected or they'd chew you out at the area office. <laughs> it, was, it was a uh, check, pretty much checks and balances. And that's basically what it did when I went to the program manager after being DC. I had to check all the plans. They had to come to me, had to do all the checking to make sure everything was right and then send it back to them so they go ahead and get signatures on it. Well, we, checking, would you have to go out to, to do it or did you just? No, we did it there in the office. And like I say, we just took what the DC had written or the planner had put on there. Now that was by hand at that point, wasn't it? Everything was by hand. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yep, that was before we had all the computers. and uh, We did a lot of, uh, of uh, planning on paper. Uh, you hear about the guys getting on the hood of a truck, you know, and doing planning. We did a lot of that. Hmm. Yeah. So your tools of the trade would be what? <laughs> a big G tablet and a pencil. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, yeah, and then we do... Something to measure with, I would think. Yeah, well, you know, like you could line it off, you know, we could, we, we, we had the, the scales. Most of our maps were 660 scales, mm -hmm. um, um, for eight inches to a mile. So we had fairly large, you know, uh, photographs to work with and we would draw it off on the map you know while I was in the field and then go back and order the maps that we needed and then go in there and put it on an ink and the repeatographs using the ink they had you could go in there and, with a q-tip and wipe it off you know and change the stuff around on it and uh, so it made it neat and you had certain insignias to make for a pond and you know different things like that a water trough and they say the area office would check all that and make sure it was done right uh, but a lot of the guys, I have to say, uh, conservation planning back then, they were more about the map than they were anything else. Where else can you go get a complete map of your ranch, you know, maybe 100,000 acres? And where they put it, they put it up on a wall. And then they put pins in it and stuff. It's supposed to be in their plan, but as soon as you get it, it's ripped out, stuck on the wall. <laughs> they make duplicate copies, I guess. <laughs> well. That's just the way it was done. Uh, uh, it was it was the, what we call the fun days. All of us old timers called the fun days. Fun. Planning with them. Yeah. Aerial photographs come into play any? Well, that's what I'm talking about. The aerial photographs that they got was what the deal. Okay. They, they okay. liked the most because you did the aerial photograph, made them a map with that aerial photograph, and then poof, it popped up on the wall. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Would you, would you go back and do some on your your folks' place? Do what now? Would you go back and do similar things on your dad's place? My, I have to be very honest with you. My dad was, uh, he didn't listen a whole lot of what I come back with. Uh, I, I remember one time, it was so funny, we had a pile of brush down in a pasture and we burned it and ashes were left there and we went and planted oats or wheat, I can't remember. Well, the wheat where we burned that brush was about this tall, or where we didn't, it was about this tall. He said, you think fertilizer would have helped if we put it on there? I said, yeah, it probably would, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, things like that would uh, it kind of amazed me, but he'd, he'd, uh, he'd save a piece of wire, he'd save a staple, he'd take a nail, straighten it out, you know, that's the way he was raised. Yeah. You know, yeah. instead of 
throwing the nail away if it's been a little bit, just straighten it out with a hammer on a piece of metal and use it back in the board. Coming through the depression, I it had did. Paid it went through the depression, correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's quite different. Well, during your DC days, were there any contentious moments with ranchers or the? You know, there were some. Um, probably the the he most heated uh, that I got into, and this was due to my uh, lack of expertise and knowledge of trying to keep up with. We had to update our cost share list every year and keep it current. And you're supposed to do that on your plans. And I missed one, and the guy went in and did his. Uh, Root plowing, plowed this humongous, of probably 640 acres, went in and seeded it, and I went in and uh, put in the payment, and the cost share rate had changed. He ended up paying some money out of pocket. Well, that come in like a Tasmanian devil and jumped right in the middle of me. And I tried to explain to him it was my fault, but you know, it was money out of his pocket. So, but from that day forward, uh, Mr. Jack Crowder and I got along and worked perfectly f until I retired and, you know, left and left Texas. But, uh, yeah, we were real close friends from that time on. Well, how did you get over that bump, though? He just finally, he just finally, after I'd owned up to it, it was my boo-boo, you know, and I called the area office and they said, there's nothing we can do about it. Mm. So, uh, and I looked at it this way too. I told him, well, Jack, here's the thing about it. You're, you, you're gonna have to pay taxes on that money anyway. This way, what you paid over and above, you didn't get paid for by the government. You can claim, you know, on the tax. So that's kinda, something. It did work out, it did work out. But there were some times like that, uh, had a very good working relationship with the other government agencies. I never had any problem working with them. So I never had, a lot of the DCs had problems with other agencies that couldn't get along with the, you know, the managers. But uh, other than that, everything went good. Was there any urban versus rural? You know, the urban in our area was so oil field oriented mm -hmm. that that was a, probably our biggest problem or uh, issues we had at Permian Basin being the oil field capital, you know, to Texas. We had a lot of issues trying to work around drilling pipelines and everything like that. I had a real good, talk about the urban, I had a real good relationship with the uh, uh, county, the county judge, all the commissioners that were there. Uh, in fact, we had a, each year, the Soil Water Conservation District would have a annual Christmas get together and invite all the commissioners and judges and from, you know, there to show them what they'd done because they were, they helped fund the district with some, some money each year. And uh, getting to talk to them was just, you know, a one, I could just walk into the county judge's office without, you know, having an appointment. Mm -hmm. You know, just say, hey, Gary, I need to come see you. Okay, come on over, Ron. And, it, and then the next judge is the same way. So, I had that open uh, dialogue with them without any problem. Well, it probably helped because you were there so long. It did. In it one did. place. It did. Yeah, and since I left, that was a unique deal. The office was opened by uh, a guy named Wyatt Lipscomb in 1961. Wyatt stayed there until 1979 and retired. Okay. I come in in 1979 and left in 1995. That's two DCs. Since I've left there, I think, what's that been? 20 years? There's probably been six DCs. Wow. I've been through there, six or seven. It, it's been a pretty much a revolving door. Hard shoes to fill when you left. Well, that may be it. That may be it. <laughs> uh, well, of course, you know, younger the younger generation uh, don't stay as long, and some of the people quit. Some of them moved on. Uh, well, during that time, you could have moved on, except the wife said, "We're not. We're not." I was. I had offers from the, at that time in a state office. That's, that's what's changed now. Uh, if they wanted you to go somewhere, they'd say, hey, Ron, we're sending you over here. they just move you over there. Mm -hmm. And I had some opportunities to move. And my wife said, if you go, go without me. So we decided to stay there. And then when the kids got out of high school, which the last one got out in 92, uh, we started looking at, you know, moving, going somewhere. And that's why I went to the area office in 95. And then from that point on, we started, they had some reorganization in 94, you know, within the USDA. And so that changed up and 
When I started out, we had 25 administrative areas in Texas. Uh, they're down to five administrative areas now. Right. Covered 254 counties. So it's been quite a bit of a change. Yeah, that's... That. Yeah. Uh, employees have decreased too, or at least in Oklahoma they've been saying that lately. Yeah, we too. had, I want to say 1,500, 12 or 1,500 employees, and I think they're down to around 700 or 800 now in Texas. Mm -hmm. and if you've got 254 counties, you know, it's not very many per county. No, okay, so then start us where you, when you shift out of the, out of the D.C., let's go on. <clears throat> what would you do next? I left uh, when I, I transferred over to the, uh, at the office that time was the uh, Pecos area and uh, uh, in Pecos, Texas, and I was a program manager for there. And so I reviewed all of the contracts that come through and oversaw all of the cost share programs for the 38, uh, uh, we had 38 million acres, I'm trying to think how many counties. But it covered uh, basically from Odessa, Texas to El Paso, all the way down to the Big Bend and up to uh, Andrews, Texas. I'm trying to think how many counties that was, but it's quite a few counties. That's a lot, yeah. But uh, <clears throat> had to oversaw, oversee all those programs that are in each one of the, the, the counties. Less time out in the field. Oh gosh, no time in the field. Except to go out and if I had to verify some things or go to the offices. The rest of the time was in the offices, you know, just doing the, the paperwork Paper. stuff. Approving all the payments, make sure when they send, they had to send all the payments in to us first. I had to go through and calculate, make sure. In fact, especially when the, the uh, contracts expired, you know, got to their end, I had to do recap from day one to make sure all the, mod because we did modifications and make sure that all the modifications met and everything added up and you come up to zero at the end. So, well, but by that time, computers were just part starting of, in. Part of we it. started the camps program at that time, and I become a camps coordinator, which is the one that trained the people how to do the system. Is that an acronym for something? Uh, computer automated mapping something. I think it's computer computer automated mapping program system or something like that. Well, that I can't remember exactly what it all stands for, but it's camps. That makes make sense. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And then you left Texas at some point. Yeah, we, uh, I stayed on as a program manager until uh, the year 2000. And I, I'd been putting in for jobs in different places. Uh, and I'd put in probably, I think I lost count, probably around 20, 20 something different locations across from Tennessee to Utah, and just all over the place and I couldn't get anything. And the state conservationist in Texas at that time was John Burt. And of course, I'd been going back and forth to uh, Temple, Texas, which is our headquarters office, because they put me into this role of forming the conservation teams of, uh, teams of, in Texas and you know consolidating some of the, the work administrative areas. So they put me on that to do that. And so I got to know the state office pretty quick then. And John said, send me your knowledge, skills, and abilities, your KSAs, and let me read them. Holy smoke, he looked like an English teacher had gotten a hold of him. <laughs> and he said, I mean, he wrote it up, and he says, now do this and do this and do that. And, uh, and then he started, uh, what's the word, uh, sponsor me, if you will. Whenever I'd send him my application, he would call and say, hey, I got a, name, a guy named Ron Hilliard who's applying for that job. Take a look. And uh, lo and behold, get a call from South Carolina. And uh, the gentleman there said, hey, I want you to come be my assistant for uh, field operations. For, cause we had two, they had two assistants covered half the state. And so I want you to be my assistant for field operations in South Carolina. And I said, I'll take it. And so John helped me through that. But uh, I never will forget John said one time, uh, they had a watershed opening in Washington D.C. I played for applied for that to go to D.C. I mean, we were open to go anywhere, and uh, just tired of Texas or just wanted something. No, it's just opportunity. The doors were open. My wife was open to it, so we were just you know. So I applied for that watershed job, and John called me. And he said, uh, "You're probably gonna get a call from Washington D.C. from Lee Bensey." I said, "Okay, he's the watershed uh, program leader there, and they want somebody to be a watershed staff." But Two or three days later, he said, you ever, uh, did he ever call you? I said, Lee never called me. He said, uh, called him back. 
And Lee said, this is what John told me, he said, what has Ron done to prepare himself for Washington, D.C.? And John said, what have you done to prepare yourself for Ron coming to Washington, D.C.? <laughs> Because <laughs> he knew me and uh, he knew my demeanor and everything like that. So it was kind of funny. He just went back and said, what have you done to prepare for him coming to Washington, D.C.? But then after that, <clears throat> like I say, I got to go, I was selected to go to South Carolina. So it was, uh, it's neat from that standpoint, you know, when you're born and raised in Texas. I lived all over Texas, basically. And you go there and the state conservationist meets you at the airport and uh, picks you up and then brings you to his house to stay with him and his and his wife and uh, the Southern hospitality in that area. And he's a black uh, gentleman, but nice as he can be, uh, Walt, Walter Douglas and his wife, Richie, and they brought us into their home. And I never will forget though, <clears throat> the first day we're there, we sat down to the meal that night and this is, a, this is a culture in South Carolina. You sit down to eat, and he says, Ron, would you say the blessing? Mm -hmm. I mean, they pop the guests right off the bat. <laughs> so, you know, here I am coming from Texas, and then boom, yeah, will you say the blessing? So they, they hit you pretty hard. They just have to make something up real quick, or your church was... Church well, I, um, you know, I, I wasn't, uh, you know, the devout, you know, personally went to church all the time, but yeah, we'd been, you know, trained in to do that, so I didn't mind saying a prayer. Did you have any idea that was going to happen, that that might no, happen? That no, might happen. none at all. I mean, it was completely, that's what I say, it just, boom, they hit you. <clears throat> and it was called on a lot, a lot of the times you'd go to meetings and stuff, and if you were the, the ranking person, you know, from SCS at that time, or NRCS, <clears throat> they would have you do it. Hmm. So just, I don't know if it's something in the South, but uh, you kind of get used to it and expect it, I guess. But, do you yeah. remember what dinner or supper was that night? I do not, I do not. I, I really don't. fried chicken. Probably. Yeah, I don't. No, I can't remember what Richie fixed that night, but anyway. Sweet tea, uh, I'm sure. It was, uh, oh gosh, sweet tea mm -hmm. is so sweet that you can't already drink it. <laughs> Sugar water almost. It's yes. almost, yeah. <laughs> when you get sweet tea in South Carolina, it's sweet. And they don't drink it unsweetened. Well, how is what you did there different from what you were doing in Texas? Oh. Um, and the state's a little different, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, the states were completely different. <clears throat> Rangeland was not there. They had a lot of forestry. Lots oh. and lots of forestry that was going on. The, uh, you know, the culture there, they did a lot of vegetables. I'm talking about huge vegetables. I'm talking about squash and uh, tomatoes and stuff like that that were large, large fields of that that were there. Um, the low country, which is down along the coast, had some cotton. Um, a lot of the black culture was, I learned a lot about the black culture and being in the deep south. Um, the difference in what I was doing <clears throat> in there and go, going from Texas to South Carolina was I was the assistant for field operations supervising DCs mm -hmm. in uh, what was it, 14 counties. We had 27 counties, I think it was, within South Carolina. I had half of them that I supervised. And the funny thing about the way South Carolina was set up, you'd think north, south, east, west. We had the whole state and each of us had counties that were sporadically scattered through there so you never had some of them you have contiguous counties some of them you didn't and then every other year you would swap so you wouldn't get a stagnant you know say it was the assistant you know get into some to make sure you'd have the same management styles or different management styles working with it well, that's an interesting approach it was it was and we had the two assistants there and then uh, in that to see i was in 2000 and 2001 or two, I can't remember which one it was, the uh, national office called down and said, Mr. Douglas, you have an opening for a GS-13 assistant for programs in your state and said, have you got that field? He's yes sir, I do. He said, I got Mr. Hilliard going into that job right now. <laughs> he hadn't even talked to me about it, but he knew I'd been in programs. Instead of them sending somebody from Washington, he knew what they was going to do. They were going to send somebody down from D.C. And he said, we're not going to do that. So he moved me over to the system for programs, which here again, I was back in my arena working all the programs for the state. And so... Was that a bump? 
a pay raise? No, it's the same pay. pay. It's the same pay. I just didn't have the supervisory authority of the field personnel. Mm -hmm. I only had a small staff in the state office. We did the programs. And uh, so I stayed there until I made my next move. So. <laughs> so how many years? Two, two years? Uh, went there in uh, January 2001 and stayed until June of uh, 03. A couple of years. Yeah. Then. And then got the bug to move again? Well, at the time we moved there, my wife said, I'm not going to work. I said, that's okay. Well, we we always get involved in the church. We the first day we go to church and we get involved in a Sunday school class. And Of course, when I met Walt, he introduced some of the other people. Hey, you need to come to this church. You need to come to this Sunday school class. So we did. And one of the guys there... Uh, Talked to my wife and said, what did you do when you was in Texas? I said, well, I worked for an uh, uh, attorney. I was a legal assistant. Oh, my gosh, I got a guy that needs to talk to you right now. She said, I don't want to work. I'm not. Oh, this guy needs help. He needs help. Well, um, we get home a day after lunch, and it's our phone ringing, and it's the guy calling. He's an attorney. He's a state senator from South Carolina that had a law office, which they could have, you know, dual, dual jobs. Yeah. He said, I really need you to go work. She said, I don't want to work. He said, well, come talk to me. So she went and talked to him. He made her an offer. She said, I'll work part-time. And it ended up, she ended up being full-time. But anyway, uh, it was a kind of weird deal. And anyway, he was state senator. Well, uh, the U.S. congressman that he was real good friends with passed away. Mm -hmm. So he got appointed to fulfill his term as a U.S. congressman in Washington. Well, he talked to my wife, and once he did that, so he had to close his law practice. They couldn't be in the law practice and be a congressman, too. So he told my wife, said, I want you to go to D.C. and be my scheduler in D.C. Do what? She said. <laughs> I have no idea what a scheduler does, but she found out pretty quick. You know, that's a big, big job. And she said, well, I can't go because my husband's here. So anyway, I started looking for jobs in Washington, D.C. And... I told Walt about it, and uh, the, the state con, and I got picked to be uh, operation management coordinator for the Northeast region, which covered 13 northern states from Virginia to Maine. And so my wife got moved to D.C., so she got to work with the congressman up there. And uh, she stayed there until uh, we did another reorganization in USDA in 2004. Mm -hmm. And my job got eliminated at the regional office so, um, had an opportunity to apply for the deputy state conservationist job, which is the step just under the state con in some of the offices that have deputies in there. And so I put my name in for that, and that's where my next move ended up going was we left Washington, D.C. and went to Wisconsin. Well, that's quite a difference, yeah. <laughs> quite, a move. quite a bit. But uh, my wife hated to give up the uh, working with the congressman. And, uh, Everybody says, well, who'd she work for? And I said, you'll, you'll know him. I mean, he's from South Carolina. And they said, we, no, we don't know him. I said, you know Joe Wilson? They said, never heard of him. I said, do you remember when Obama was giving his speech and the guy stood up and said, you lied? That's him. <laughs> A very passionate mom. My wife sitting there said, oh, my God, Joe, what did you do? <clears throat> but he's, he's still that way. He's just a very passionate, very understanding, probably is one of the straightest politicians I've ever met. I mean, he wouldn't, he wouldn't take a nickel under the table for nothing. Mm. That's just the kind of, his son is now the attorney general for South Carolina, and he's still a congressman up there in, in D.C. I think he won by this year 76% of the vote. Oh, that's, yeah. Yeah, he's been there since 2000, what, two or something like that. Yeah, it's pretty neat. But anyway, <clears throat> we left there and went to... Uh, Wisconsin, Madison, Wisconsin. A lot of snow. Yeah, and I think I went there, and I know I went there. Yeah, I, found out, I drove in a snowstorm getting there, and I moved, I think I moved there in November, if I'm not mistaken, because it was January before we finally found a house and uh, got moved up there, moved up there in an ice storm. Couldn't even pull up in the driveway because the ice was thick, you'd slide out. <laughs> so it was welcome to 
to, to Wisconsin. And then she said, where have you brought me? Yeah, well, <laughs> by that time, we were, we were very, you know, much into the move. And I, I still tell kids today, or, or youngsters and everybody else, that I said, don't be afraid to walk through that door. Go through that door, and I said, never look back. Just keep going, because if you go through that door, make that opportunity, that move. I said, another door will open in front of you, or two may open in front of you. I said, just keep, just keep going. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's kind of the way we looked at it. And so we ended up there in Wisconsin, and my wife couldn't go to work for. Um, she's going to transfer as a congressional office, you know, from Washington up there to Wisconsin, but. Um, Joe was a Republican and Wisconsin's very Democratic. So, so they wouldn't even hire him. <laughs> it didn't make any difference. But her affiliation was through the Republican side. So she couldn't get a job in the congressman's office there. Yeah. Not at all. So she went back into banking, which she'd done when we first got married. Uh, on our early, 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 early marriage. And went into banking. And so I went to work there as a deputy state conservationist. My main job was personnel and overseeing kind of the personnel of all actions for the state and doing some other things too, but working on plans of operations and working that type and then still going out to the field, but the state con was the one, you know, that was actually in charge. And so I was a backup and give her a chance to, is the first female supervisor I worked for. Okay, that would have been in 2000, 2003? Four, 2004, <clears throat> her name was Pat Leavenworth. And uh, she originally come from Connecticut, but uh, she was kind of she was the breadwinner. Her husband mainly stayed at home, raised kids. So, how was she perceived in the in the community? Oh, great, great, great. Was yeah. it an issue? <laughs> no, no. Pat was very well respected. She was respected there, respected at the national headquarters. In fact, when I got to be the deputy there, they moved her to headquarters for a, for a you know a stint to go up there. I went there, like I say, I started. I went out working there and then in January, I can't remember when she went, it was sometime, probably springtime, she went to D.C. and did a, you know, a short tour duty there and I, you know, I stayed there to, to, run, the, to run the state. Would there be people that would skip her to come to you though, that didn't want to deal with a female? Not really, no. Not that, not no. that you were aware of anyway? No, not that I was aware of. In fact, and the thing about it was she was very inclusive to get me tuned in to everything that was going on. And, because uh, I was there for a training. You know, deputies were trained. It was supposed to be a training ground for them to move up to a state okay. conservationist later on. Where had she come from? Do you know? You know, the only thing I know is she was in Connecticut before that. Oh. And I don't know exactly what her, her time was. I'm guessing she had to move around a lot in order to she get, did. To get she did. up. To move up, move mm -hmm. around. Yeah. But so, very, very, uh, very great person to work with. So you're le learning more, branching out with each move, just about. Oh, what? Adding more to your repertoire. And if, if you if you've been to any of the offices, and if they still got some of the old photographs, you know, the old old photographs of uh, rolling fields and stuff like that, all of them were made in Wisconsin. They had to be. <laughs> the the, the uh, farming up there is so beautiful. It's it's a, and it's not that. I mean, it's a beautiful place to be. It gets cold in the winter. But uh, we enjoyed our time there, but uh, that didn't last long. Is it mostly dairy? <laughs> I mean, I think of cheese when I think of Wisconsin. Oh gosh, yeah. Cheese and uh, dairy. my wife with the cream puffs and the cheese curds. Oh gosh, she still thinks about those. Because <laughs> that's, their, that's their big deal. Yeah. So once you left there, you went to? Well, I was there in, in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. We lived in a little town of Stoughton, which is about 25 miles away, and I drove back and forth. And one day I'm sitting there in the uh, office, and I get a phone call from Washington. It's Bruce Knight, the chief of NRCS, and he says, Ron. Uh, he'd gone through Pat, and he talked to Pat at the state con first, and he said, I got a place for you to spend the winter. I said, spend the winter? <laughs> said, I said, where's that? He said, the island of Guam. I said, Really, what's the deal? Well, we got a little issue out there. And he said, I know how you you work around people. Uh, and uh, this, the uh, director out there has uh, been moved and the uh, 
person that's acting right now is going to go ahead and retire out. She, Joan, uh, gosh, what was her last name? She used to be a regional conservationist. But anyway, she, she, they lived in Guam. Her husband was a surveyor there. I'll think of her name in a minute. But she's going to go ahead and retire out. <clears throat> and we need somebody going there to restore the relationships with the agencies and everything because they've been frayed a little bit mm -hmm. because of the lady before that. And I won't get into that issue. And I said, this September the 30th, he calls me. And I said, when I need to be there? He said, October the 8th. So I called my wife and I said, I got a call from Washington. She said, oh my God, where are we going now? And I said, we're going to Guam. She said, I have no idea where it's at, but I'm going. <laughs> so October the 8th, we're sitting on a tarmac in, in, in Guam with four suitcases. That's not even quite, a, not over a week. Not two. two weeks, right at two weeks is wow. what it was. And uh, we went to our neighbors. We said, hey, we got a, we got a 90 day um, assignment in Guam. Here's the keys to the cars. Would you start them, you know, periodically keep the batteries up? Here's the keys to the house. Would you water our plants on a weekly basis? And here are some uh, priority mail envelopes. Go through the mail, stuff that looks good, tape it up, send it to us on a weekly basis. They did that. We, you know, we've known them since January. This is September, or October. And so we jumped on the plane and went to Guam. Wow. I paid for my wife's trip that, you know, they paid for me to go over there. And we, we uh, they put us in a high rise condo and uh, we'd been there two weeks and then the first uh, uh, typhoon hit. <laughs> it was, it, we had a skirting, we didn't get a full blow of it, but <clears throat> we're in a 20 story high rise condo. We're on the 18th floor. And my wife was about to have fits and she got checking around with some of the people and they said, that's the safest place on the island of Guam. It's solid concrete. And that's where people go to, huh. you know, and because uh, they had a big, basement and everything in the uh, underground so we made it through there and people called her and said how would you how did you survive the uh the typhoon she said is it's like a west texas sandstorm with no sand <laughs> <laughs> you know blew a lot but because uh, we lived in west texas for, for so many years but uh yeah we had i was uh, i lived in guam but i supervised american samoa saipan Ponape, Palau, plus the island of Guam. And I had a Rhoda and Tinian, which were two other. So I had like, I had three flag territories, which was Guam, Saipan, and American Samoa. And then I had uh, Ponape and Palau, and I had to work through the ambassadors. So I got to work through the State Department, work with the ambassadors to get permission to come on the island because we had people that were stationed there working in the offices. And uh, got to work with those, uh, Ambassador, and it was a neat re working relationship. In fact, I was at the ambassador's headquarters in 2004 when Bush got reelected. That's the only t live TV we had was at the ambassador's headquarters. And I got to see the results of the election in 2004 mm. on that island. But <clears throat> the people there we worked with were very open and uh, they looked at me and anybody else that was in charge as Mr. Agriculture. It was a, it was a you know, a pretty high ranking deal. In fact, uh, we went to the island of uh, Ponape and we go out to see Mr. Thomas, Robert Thomas. Rodasio was our technician that lived in uh, Ponape and Phil Giles was the DC that was in Ponape. <clears throat> and we went out to see Mr. Thomas and these people literally live on the side of a mountain. They have no facilities. They're, they're, if you've been to Mexico, the shacks are, are very uh, Marriottic compared to what they had in, on the island of Ponape. And wow. Mr. Thomas was kind of in charge of like 200 people. <clears throat> he was kind of like, he wasn't married you know, to all of them, but they, they looked at him and he was kind of the boss of everybody. And they had a little ceremonial place they went to, and it was just concrete <clears throat> with a tin tin roof over it. And so I got ready to sit down. They brought the mat, the ceremonial mat, out and put it out, and that's where I had to sit because I was the distinguished person that was meeting there. And we were sitting there, and Rodasio, who's a native there, was 
translating, you know, in their language of what he was asking. And I remember I had on a baseball cap, and uh, Rodacio told him, said, need to remove my hat. And I thought, I'm being disrespectful, you know, having a hat on here and it's their meeting place. So I took it off, and he says, no, the little ones want to see your gray hair. They don't get to see gray hair. <laughs> so that's the only reason they want to take my hat off, is to see my hair. But uh, <laughs> uh, it's, it, it, it was just, I can't remember what the name was, Casa Lea, Casa, something like that. Whenever we meet someone and they, they, you'd exchange uh, greetings with them when you come there. And then whenever you left, you'd leave them with some kind of, we'd leave them with melon seeds or something like that mm -hmm. that they could plant, you know, and harvest and things. So, but the uh, main thing we worked with the on those islands was uh, everybody had a pig. In order to have status, you had to have a pig. Uh, you raise sweet potatoes, bananas, and taro, which is a tuberous fruit too, or a plant. But the pigs that have an area just big enough for a pig to be in called piggeries, and uh, they had no way to take care of the affluent, you know, the, the, the feces and stuff that come here. So we would design them a concrete pad and then put a channel on one side and have a little bit slope so they could wash it off. And then they take that affluent out of that little channel, and we took guttering just like on a house, and just laid it like tinker toys on top of each other, and let it transfer it, transport it down to a, a banana tree. And when you get there to the banana tree, you take a nail and knock a hole in it, and that would drip there to the banana tree. Stalk bananas usually make about 30 pounds. With the pig affluent, it would go up to a hundred pounds. Wow. So we increased two and a half times, you know, nearly three, or three times their production. And at eight cents a pound, that was quite a significant amount of money change. And so they thought we were pretty good. The problem was, is just like in anything else, whether you do it here in the States or you do it there, is maintaining that conservation practice you put in. The, the, guttering would get knocked off and so they'd leave their transport down there. They wouldn't go back and check everything on a regular basis. So it's the same thing as conservation farmers do now. A lot of times they don't go back and on a larger scale check everything and make sure everything's operating right. And they did it on a smaller scale there. But we had one guy named Ernie Gustig who was the chairman of the, had two conservation districts in Guam. He raised sweet corn. That was his deal. He'd truck in or ship in chicken manure and fertilize his, mm -hmm. I think he had like 10 acres. But Ernie would plant two rows of sweet corn on space them out weekly basis or two weeks or whatever. And then he'd harvest them, put them back a pickup truck and take them down to the post office and sell them for a dollar a year. And that was the way he raised money and kept himself going. And our largest, let's see, our largest ranching operation was 200, about 200 acres on the island of Saipan. Mm. Yeah, had cattle operation there. But, uh, you know, the uniqueness of that was the island of Tinian, if you ever heard of Tinian, is where the Enola Gay took off from to drop the bomb. Mm. And so Tinian is still there. It's, it's a, still a World War II island. It's almost as pristine as it was there because it's only like, I want to say 800 people live on the island. And so the bunkers are still there, the runways are, you know, grown up, but you just look back and just think what it was like in World War II to go see those. So that part of my experience was very rewarding to do that. Sounds like it. So Glad you said, yes, I'll go. I did. Yeah. And then my wife was, uh, when we first got there, I, had, I hadn't been there probably two or three weeks right after we had the uh, typhoon. I got called to come back to the, to the States for a meeting and left her there. And she was about almost uh, went into hysteria because, you know, she was in a foreign land, you know, 24 hour plane flight. From the time you take off to the time you get to DC, it's 24 hours because you count your layovers and everything. So you got a lot of time in the air. It's a long, it's seven hours from there to Hawaii. You're a long like, way from Wisconsin. It's a long ways. <laughs> so anyway, I left her there come back to the meeting and went back. And then we left there, I guess it was the middle of January. Yeah, sometime in the middle of January, they said, hey, we need you to come back to the States. 
I thought, I was going to get to stay longer. And they said, no, we're going to send somebody else over there and let them pick up from there. My wife cried because we had to leave. And we still stay in contact with them. We were... We got into the church, we worked in the church over there, and we worked with the people on the island. It's, you know, you just get into it. And they, they, they really like it. They all like Americans who are liberating them from the Japanese. And so it's, it's a very fun place to go to. Yeah. And Island of Palau, if you've never been to a place, you've heard of Fiji and all these others, mm -hmm. Island of Palau is pristine. The most beautiful coral you'll ever see in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, diving and snorkeling is just unbelievable. <laughs> And uh, they filmed the 2004 Survivor series of I Will Pull Out. Okay, yeah. So, anyway, we come back in January, he sent me back to Wisconsin. So, but I had talked with uh, Bruce Knight, the chief, and he said, Ron, you're coming back to the States. Where would you like to go? And I said, I've always wanted to go to Alaska. He said, uh, Okay, we'll see what we can do about that. We're gonna have an opening up there. That's all right. He said, "We'll put you get your application in. We'll see what happens." And uh, so I put my application in because I was still a deputy, you know, and it's trying to. This is a state con job, you know, to move up. And so I put my name in, and uh, what happened? He called me and says, "Well, Ron, you're not gonna get uh, Alaska because Bob Jones is." Uh, Want to go up there and he's leaving Alabama and going up there and we'll give him that opportunity to go. So you got seniority on you. I said, okay. But he said, uh, I'm either going to send you to Wisconsin, I mean, uh, West Virginia or o uh, Ohio. I said, okay. <laughs> you know. Anyway, he said, I'm going to send you to acting in uh, West Virginia. So I went to be the acting state conservationist in West Virginia and that was in March. 05 after I come back from Guam in January. And uh, my wife here again said, whoop, where are we going? So we ended up there and then he called me about a month later and said, you're gonna be the state conservation because I can't announce it until May. So just keep it under your hat. So first of May, I become the state conservationist of, of West Virginia. Were they having issues or something? Uh-huh, uh -huh. yeah, same deal. They had some problems with uh, of uh, the uh, other agencies and some of the things that the people that were in the office there had made some boner decisions and they'd already moved them out. So Larry Caldwell and I both were sent there at the same time. <clears throat> and so between the two of us, uh, Larry and his expertise in watershed and just me being there as a, as a person to say yes, and this is what we'll do. Uh, we worked together for a period of time and then Larry come back after a couple months and I stayed there is the state conservationist. Smoothing some feathers or rebuilding bridges both. or both. We did both. That type of thing. It was a it was a very contentious moment there at some times and go to the meetings and say, You gonna lie to us like the last ones lied to us? And mm. no, we're gonna tell you exactly when are you gonna get it done. Well we can't tell you. Well they thought it would be in two weeks. No, we can't do it that fast. We will get it done and we'll tell you when it is done and you know, we just were straightforward. Larry is very uh, Meticulous, you know, mm -hmm. putting stuff together. Oh, I'm surprised. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, uh, we had some great times there. So, is that when you learned about watersheds, or had you picked up some knowledge about them along the way? We had water. We had a little bit of watersheds. Uh, in fact, when I was in Lockhart, <clears throat> we had a watershed program there, mm -hmm. and I was assigned seven watersheds for operation and maintenance there. Not at the magnitude. We had 21 structures in, in that county. I had seven, the VC had seven, the technician had seven. So I had a little sprinkle in the watershed. Uh, and like I say, I went to West Texas, we had some watershed, but all those were dry. We have watershed structures out of West Texas, but they're dry. None of them hold water. You go out there and there'll be a big dam and it'll just be, look like a gravel pit. But they're flood prevention structures because one of the towns of Sanderson in 1965 lost nearly the whole town population because the canyons flooded and washed people away mm -hmm. in, in their sleep. So, so, yeah, those things have a significant impact on the, you know, the economy and, the, and the, the people as far as safety. But anyway, <clears throat> we uh, West Virginia had a very active watershed program. 
Uh, but one of the things that Larry and I had to, to work with there was that uh, we were basically told when we got there to shut the program down because of funding and they weren't going to fund us. And, but Larry and I are just hard-headed enough that we wouldn't going to do that. So we figured out some way to make it work. But, uh, and we did some some pretty ingen ingenious type movements, you know, to get things to work. The biggest thing that hit us, because um, that was in 05, that was in May of 05, was uh, we got our budget for that year and, and uh, we were like five million in the hole. And in that sense, five million is a lot of money, you know, to make up for. Uh, if you want to call it a salvation, they had the big hurricane Katrina and everything in August of 05. Mm. And they were out looking for people to come down and work the hurricane. So I sent, I want to say, if I'm not mistaken, 40 people to Louisiana to work. They picked up salaries, benefits, and everything for those people to work. And I made my budget whole by them going down there to work in uh, Louisiana. Mm. So, That's a smart move, and it served a purpose both ways. <laughs> I had to fight for that, though, because my supervisor at that, uh, uh, what was his name? Good gosh. Didn't think I'd ever forget his name because he was real, he was a real uh, hard-headed guy. Dick Coombs. Dick Coombs was a regional conservationist. And at that time, we had a meeting in Houston, Texas, uh, for the National Association of Conservation Districts. And I told him I was going to go to it, and he said, if you do, you do it out of protest. And I said, well, I'm going to go. And I went down and I met with uh, uh, Don Gombert, who was the state conservationist in Louisiana. And I told him, I said, here, Don, here's who I've got that can go work. He says, you're a technician, soil cons, they're all ready to go. Are you sure, Ron? I said, yeah. Can you give me a definite amount? I said, yes, sir. I'm, I'm sure they won't do it. They won't do it now. So I called back state office and and he got them going and I got my budget hold and Dick said, well, I guess you did the right thing. I said, yes, sir, I did. So, <laughs> but, you know, sometimes you had to fight City Hall yeah. in order to make it work because I mean, there's some some guys that'll just cow down to it. I'm not one to do that. So. Well, you had the information and everything to show too that it would, that it would work. Yeah, mm. so it paid. His his deal was how can you afford to go to Houston and spend a thousand dollars or so when you're in the budget you're know, five million in the black and the red you know and I I more than made that back up you know when I got my budget back up so yeah that, that helped. Wonder if others were figuring that out too. We had we had a couple another state that was in the same way and they they finally figured it out and I think Oklahoma was one of them that had to send some people down there because they sent them there also. So we worked Katrina and uh, what was the other one? There was two of them back to back. Uh, anyway, and then we ended up sending some people to uh, Utah to work uh, some flooding they had down there too. So anytime I could dispatch some people out were ready to work, and as long as they pick up salary and benefits, they just benefited me. Mm -hmm. You know, in order way to maintain you either had to go through, get rid of them, or some, figure out some way to pay them. So that's what we did. And how would you cover services in the state while they were gone? Very, it was very contentious too, you know, but we had to do it. Yeah. We, we, everybody understood that we wanted to make sure we kept our personnel. That was the main thing. Keep the full complement of personnel, because I found out if you ever go down, you never go back up. So we tried to stay as static as we could with the people. And so we kept them on board. Well, plus, I guess everyone was willing to help okay, in, yeah. in some capacity, so it would work. That's true. Those who couldn't go picked up the slack there. Yeah. One of the big things we did in, in uh, West Virginia when Larry was there is we had a place called Dunloop Creek, and it was an area down in the southern part of uh, West Virginia. The people lived down there, and every time it rained, it flooded. They got flooded out. So we went through and proposed a buyout of all these people buy their houses. Most of them are mobile homes or old houses anyway, to buy them out and relocate them. 
Larry and I got all that started when he, he was there and when I was there and I moved on, Larry moved on, and it finally become uh, a program and was initiated. And uh, they, they did the buyout program there. And then the last thing that I did and signed off on was the largest, to this day I think, the largest funding for a watershed project was the uh, El, uh, Elkwater Fork watershed project uh, it's completely 100%, and Larry, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's 100% roller compacted concrete dam. Everything 100%. And it was also set up to be a water supply for municipality within that watershed, and there's a water treatment plant on that. I can't remember what how many millions of dollars it was, but it was one of the largest projects. Funded during Senator Byrd uh, tenure as a, a senator, in West Virginia, and the largest one for the state or for the whole country. Things for the whole country. The whole country. As far as oh. money, money expended for it. And your signature is there. Signature is on it. That's the last thing. <laughs> yeah, I didn't get to see it completed because it was completed after I left. But with Larry's help, the uh, Dick Judy, the uh, the state engineer, all the watershed planning staff, and everybody working together in Senator Byrd's office. We got that thing through, and Dick Judy just sent me some pictures of what it looks like today. It's one gorgeous I was place. going to say, have you been back to see it? I have not been back to see it. Uh, in fact, I'm supposed to go back, uh, we're going back next October for a football game because Texas Tech and West Virginia play, and I'm plan I told Dick I was going to come over and spend extra days and he'd take me over to it, so okay. we already got that planned out. I never got, to, Larry's got to see it, but I have not got to see it. That would be fun, I would yes. think. I mean, that's that's what I like is the closure when you you know you start something because I signed off on that to approve the money, mm -hmm. and then get it completed and then go back and you know finally pick it up. Yeah. So, but that was that's kind of the way West Virginia went, and uh, I never will forget uh, how I got. Uh, we were at the state uh, meeting of conservation districts down in Charleston, and uh, Bill Wilson. Billy Wilson was the uh, chairman of the uh, uh, Oklahoma Conservation Districts there. And uh, he was at that meeting. He was also, I think he was still reigning national uh, NACD president that year, if I'm not mistaken, 2005, 2006, somewhere. He's standing in the hallway at uh, Charleston, West Virginia. I'm standing not from here to that door from him. His phone ring, my phone rings. My phone says, we're, we're sending you to Oklahoma. Billy's getting a call saying, we're sending Hilliard to Oklahoma and we're looking at each other. <laughs> it was it was so funny. He got the call that I was gonna be moved to Oklahoma from West Virginia. It and wasn't a choice, it just says you're going? Well, what happened is uh, they had some issues and you've, you've interviewed uh, with uh, Daryl, Daryl Dominic, when he left Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And after he left, there was some pretty sour taste, very sour taste in the conservation district. And here again, uh, Arlen Lancaster was the uh, chief at that time, and he had talked to Dick Coombs, and Dick Coombs said, hey, you need to look at Hilliard to go there. And, He's done this and he's done that. He did this in Guam, he did this in West Virginia. And so Arlen called me up and said, I need you to go there. And I said, you're gonna have to put on some pretty strong <laughs> britches because they're going to try to bite you. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, they're, they're pretty upset that Daryl's left, you know. And I didn't know how contentious it was until I got there, but it was pretty, the relations were pretty well frayed. And so I had not worked it out for me, but I'd say, I told him, I said, I'll, I'm for the challenge. So I took off in, in November of 06. I report to uh, Oklahoma. To Stillwater? To Stillwater. As and state conservation. As the state conservation of Stillwater. And the first morning I, I uh, walk up to the office, had no keys or nothing. I just knew where I was supposed to be. And I get out of my car and come around the corner. Larry Caldwell, and we walk in together. 
<laughs> well, that helped. It did. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had a working relationship because, you know, Larry kind of laid the groundwork for me coming in because anytime that you move, the first thing and you do it too probably is you go on Google and find out what the heck, you know, who is Hilliard? Who is this Ron Hilliard? Mm -hmm. And uh, they, they, they Google the heck out of you to figure out what you've done in these other states because, I mean, I can go back and Google my name and they're still there. You know, my name still comes up as doing this or doing that. So, anyway, I ended up going to Oklahoma and that's uh, started out and I didn't know how long I was going to be there. But getting, you know, getting closer to home again, back to Texas. It was. It's five hours, um, five hour drive instead of 15 from West Virginia. So, in what was it, 30 from Washington, D.C. or something like that. Were you but, anticipating that being your last career move? I really didn't know. Uh, I really didn't know. We uh, we had talked about it, uh, and what we were going to do, uh, and how many how many years I was going to stay on. Because at that time, I see in '06 made me what fifty eight. Yeah, yeah. Because I've been sixty. Yeah, yeah. I tried to turn seventy. In this year, so I would have been 58. And then I'd planned to leave at 60 is what I thought about doing. Is age 60 is what I. Uh, and what was what was so odd when I was growing up, and you may have heard the term back in alt six. You know, people do this back in alt six. Mm -hmm. When I go to Oklahoma, alt six, <laughs> it was. I mean, it's just like boom. You know, this is kind of one of those weird deals that happen. But uh, no, we kind of settled in there, and then uh, and in 2008, uh, which is my 60th birthday, uh, my wife uh, said, "Hey, you know, I think we're going to uh, go ahead and just think about go ahead and retire." And uh, but then we hung on until 2010. Uh, could be 62. My wife said, I'm going to retire from and start my Social Security in 62. We'd already bought a house in Texas on the lake. And so we were going back down there and forth on the weekends and trying to put it together. And uh, so in October 2010, she decided to go ahead and retire. And she said, I'm going to go ahead and move down to the house and get everything ready. So we sold our house, had all the furniture moved down there. And she moved in there full time, and I moved in my RV. And that was in October. And I said, "I'll see you in the end of December." Well, we got got together over the holidays and Thanksgiving. I said, "You know, I got to look at my retirement, and if I hang around a few more years, I can, you know, it'll add so much to my retirement check." She said, "Well, what do you want to do?" Well, uh, 2013, I finally. Hung it up. <laughs> 65 at that time? Exactly. Yeah, I was 65. But she'd already moved down there, and so I went back and forth on the weekends. So I got familiar with this interstate out here and the Interstate 35, depending on which way I wanted to go home and which way was the weather was the best. And uh, drove back and forth for the last three years on the weekends. And where would you park your RV in Stillwater? Uh, just as you come into Stillwater, uh, they're on the right hand, Eddie, I can't remember what his name is, just before you, you come into town, it's set off down on the, on the right hand side there. Okay. Uh, it's an RV park, I don't remember exactly where you turn off to get to it, but it's right there on the highway, just before you come into Stillwater. Unusual for a state con to be, have that living arrangement. Yeah. Well, what else was going on in Oklahoma at that time, since you were taking over the reins? Well, like I say, the, the conservation the conservation commission was uh, uh, basically, you know, pretty much underfunded. They were always looking for funds, and that's kind of what got the, the issues uh, started with the funding issues with Oklahoma and the national office. And finally, we worked together and um, figured out a way that we could get them some funding. And once we started getting funding for them and making things work, you know, relations really improved and. Uh, I, th I think I had pretty good, you know, results with them, um, and you know, I was, and that's another reason in 2013. It's kind of on a high note, you know. I said it's time to go for 
something else, you know, pops up and 65 years old and, you know, I want to have some time for myself. So um, we decided to just go ahead and take the retirement and, and leave out. But watersheds was another thing. They tried to get me to shut down the watershed program also when I went to Oklahoma. Here. Hmm. Yeah. Same thing as they did in West Virginia. We don't have can't fund it. us. And they had a watershed staff, you know, Count Larry and everybody else is on there. I said, I said, I can't do that. So we just kind of just played under this, you know, radar screen. And next thing you know, we started getting funding and uh, we just kept things going. Uh, you know, then we had the hurricane air and it went through and, and washed out everything and had to re do a lot of rehabbing. Cottonwood 15 was, a, you know, a one that we had to do a, a decommissioning on. We had, uh, I can't remember the name of the watershed, but we had the first complete watershed with all the rehab dams that had been rehabbed within the whole watershed. Mm -hmm. um, we did a lot of new constructions that we got done. It was, uh, watershed started picking up and we started getting more funding and more funding. Uh, but we always kept things ready to go whenever they said they had money. You know, Bill Porter, bless his heart, and I'm like, you know, Sorry that he passed away, and but Bill was uh, meticulous about keeping that stuff ready and everything. So that when they said they had money, it was ready. Get it, get it before it gets gone. Yeah, and then and then Larry with all of his his paperwork, you know, his meticulous paperwork, you know, everything was up to par, everything ready to go. Uh, all of our plans and designs and as builts and everything. He had all this stuff, you know, put together for all the structures, uh, and then Dam Watch comes up and. We get into the dam watch, and so we know has some alerts and when you know we have some issues and stuff. So all that happened during the the time I was there, and so I know it's just grown in you know multiple since then. A lot of the 50 year anniversaries of some of the sites, right? Were about that time too, right. from what I understand. Yeah, that was uh, I think it's what Sergeant Major was the first one, 1965. I think that come up. It was the first one. Uh, it, it gets a little foggy. It's been six years. <laughs> well, I've read all that too, and it gets a little foggy even at that. Yeah. It's more around Magnum, wasn't it, Mangum? I think so, yeah. It's, uh, like I say, I was talking to some of the guys up front, and, you know, working five locations in Texas and six different other states plus Guam, I just trying to remember in Washington, D.C. Trying to remember names sometimes, it gets a little, I know who they were, but just can't recall them all the time. I think you've done great, though. <laughs> was, was there a favorite spot? If you had to pick one, where, where, where did you like the best? Uh, you know, we seriously thought about going back to South Carolina to retire. We seriously did. And the other one was Guam. There was the two spots, and the only thing that brought us back to Texas, because we were born and raised here, was uh, four granddaughters who lived in Fort Worth. Funny how that works. It does. <laughs> and that's why we moved to the Fort Worth area uh, over there at Lake Granbury. It's, it, we're, a, we're a close family, but not, uh, what did you say, daily contact. We're not going to live next door to you. We're not your babysitters. We didn't raise your kids. I mean, we raised you, now you raise your kids. But we're not here to you know keep them for you. And so 40 miles away was enough that we had a little warning things coming we just kick out the back door uh, <laughs> but it was nice enough for them to come over and they spend the day and go home mm -hmm. and not spend and they never spend weeks with us or days with us never having their whole life the granddaughters never were that way and we weren't trying to be standoffish but it's we want to be close to them so we can see them raised well the oldest one now is 17 and she goes off to college next year attend so, a few ball games and such yeah yeah and you know they're into my granddaughter 17 she's into ballet dance uh she's on swim team cross country uh she'll doll up and go to the to the ball and, and stuff like this but then the weekend she comes to the farm it's camouflage and a rifle i mean she can she can tr change within a half a second wow. and then she'll go right back and go back into her deal well, that's good yeah. to be able to do that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, and I mean, I, I appreciate that today. They do. And then I got one granddaughter that uh, she's hairs and nails. That's all she thinks about. So nails got to be right, hairs got to be She don't want to get sweaty. <laughs> she's 14. 
So, you know, that's just personalities. Sure. So, yeah, it's just... Uh, and you've learned about that through all of these positions you've been in. You know, that's the most rewarding, I think, uh, part about the whole working in the SCS and RCS arena was that I had that great opportunity to go to different areas uh, within the U.S. and outside the U.S. Uh, and learn about the cultures. You know, you get the black cultures down in South Carolina. Uh, you get the island cultures, you know, from there. I mean, before that, before I even started working for NRCS, when I worked for the seed company, I lived in Mexico for three months out of the year. So I learned the culture of Mexico. And in West Texas, 94% Hispanic when I lived out there in the Pecos area. So just knowing the different cultures and learning how to work with them. And I think it was probably one of the biggest assets I had of helping me go to these different areas and make things work was just understanding that people are different. Really? Uh, and change does not come easy. No, 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 no. Um, it's uh, probably one of the biggest things I did <laughs> in Oklahoma that sometimes was uh, frowned on a little bit by some, but we had an all employees meeting in 2007 or 2008. I can't remember, maybe it was nine. I mean, one of those years. And we brought everybody in, and I brought in the civil rights bunch from Washington, D.C. And I had an, a, a training on uh, uh, LGBT community just for a, give them the uh, overview to understanding of the LGBT community. And I had some that uh, felt that I was being pushy to them to do otherwise. And, uh, had a couple of congressionals filed on me from one that I was trying to convert them. And I said, no, it, it's it's an awareness because you work with these people in the field. Mm -hmm. And I'm the only state con I know of out of the whole United States that trained every employee on the LGBT. Well, it was forward thinking on your part. I thought it was. Yeah. I mean, and it was all, it was all very orchestrated and everything. It was... Uh, because, you know, we work with these people, like I say, it doesn't matter whether it be black, Asian, or whatever it is, Native American. That was another thing. Coming to Oklahoma and learning Native American cultures, oh my gosh, uh, it's been rewarding. E even now, uh, in my work and stuff that I do, just, you know, I don't really, I do some things of some freelance type stuff, but just understanding that. And, and I got a lot of people in the LGBT community that are around too, so. I'm glad I got the training myself. Yeah, it be good. Just to understand them. Yeah. So Oklahoma was a good move. Yeah, Oklahoma was a good move. It was. It was, like I say, it was contentious there for a couple of years. Uh, uh, it's. It's a definitely, probably one of the most. Uh, I'd say culture specific. I'm gonna say culture specific states that I've been in because of the Native American population mm -hmm. more so than any other state. You don't have that influence of one culture. You have a very diverse culture in other states, but Oklahoma being Native American is a, a little bit more. Uh, what to say? It's a. Uh, the people you have to be very careful to work in that that environment. So. Well, I mean, it's similar to Texas with the oil being part of that too. Oh, that's that is a different bunch of people there. Yeah, drilling, understand drilling that. And that conservation aspect, I'm sure, is still yep. needs work. A lot, a lot. You know, and then these guys, they're out there for the for the money, the oil, and everything like that. That's what they're there for. Mm -hmm. And trying to get them to stop and look at the land. It's nothing they're even think about that. But. The environmental side of that has grown since I was a DC there. Used to, um, they do oil spills and stuff like that, and we'd have to go out and survey them and everything. A lot of times now they don't even get a call. They they have an environmental firm that comes in, and cleans them up, you know, remediates them, and go on. So oh, that's, good. that's that's picked up pretty quick. And then during your time span, that they changed the name from SCS to NRCS. Do you have like an, opinion, an opinion on that? Well, this is the one of the things that I want to say. This is my, my opinion. When I grew up in the SCS, the SCS was 
And we always, before Silas Flannoy called me and said, hey, I want you to be, you know, I want you to apply for this job, you know, SES. Uh, we always referred, referred to them as the soil boys. You know, we saw them go out in their pickup. It was a green pickup with a white top. They were all colored the same. And it had soil conservation service written down the side. In 94, we changed our name to be more environmental friendly to Natural Resources Conservation Service. We got rid of the green and white trucks. We went to generic white, blues, browns, greens, whatever like that. No signage on the side. We fell out of the public's eye. That's my opinion. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think back, the same, same in those same years, if you remember, uh, if you were in Texas, we had them. Border Patrol was almost the same way. Their, their vehicles were color coded that you knew it was a Border Patrol. Now they're not. They're you know pretty much generic white or something, mm. but they still have water patrol on the side. And when you lose that visual identity, mm. it's hard for people to pick up on it. And then the media also has pointed at uh, a lot. Not so much now as they used to, but subsidies that farmers are getting. Farmers are getting these subsidies, and they have big you know. 60 minutes on subsidies and stuff like that. And I've been on a plane and people say, well, what do you think about these farmers getting subsidies? And I say, well, you know, if they didn't get a subsidy, you'd be paying $8 a gallon for milk instead of $1.95 a gallon for milk, as I did in Guam. I paid $8 a gallon for milk in Guam in 2004. I said, you're paying what, dollar something for two dollars for a loaf of bread? You'd be paying five, six, seven dollars for a loaf of bread. Subsidies help offset some of these. You'd be paying more. Oh, I didn't know that. They just think about the farmers getting these subsidies. You know, they, they're making big money. That's good. Educate us in different ways. <laughs> but this is something that, you know, a lot of the people, millenniums, surely, my, my kids, I, I I have to say that they grew up in a little bit of farming community because my wife and her brother and sister still farm a thousand acres of farmland. We got cotton and wheat, and uh, we still got our our homestead that we live on. This is 42 acres that's left out of the 60. We got another 320 acres that uh, my son bought from us, but we still manage it for hunting and grazing and stuff like that. So they still have a close net. Uh, to the community, farming community, whereas some of theirs, those, they're in their forties, those kids don't have that. Mm -hmm. So, do they understand what Dad did? Not really. Mm -hmm. No, Not really. no, they don't. But they have, they have in these. Um, I still, in fact, I just got a call day before yesterday from a friend down in Houston on the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo that I work. Uh, he's got a brother up in Iowa somewhere. Is it? He wanted to get some guidance from me as to what he needed to do. He bought 17 acres up there and he wanted to build a, a pond on it. And I told him to go to the NRCS office. Well, he's got that set up now. And, uh, you know, so you get these calls from people that um, still ask you questions. And then it, it's, it's really amazing that I can go to a, our coffee shop there in my little hometown and they want me to tell them about programs that are going on. I said, you need to go out of the office. I'm out of it now, you know? I, I don't keep up with it. I mean, except for what I do. But what they do, you need to go down to the local office. And, but they'd rather sit around a coffee shop. And that's where I used to do all my work in the early years. We can't do that now. We're not, you know, they kind of frown on it. Oh, especially if the the truck was labeled and they know you're in there, I guess. Well, well even back, back then I had the green and white trucks. We used to go, we used to go to the coffee shop and visit with those guys. I guess that could be, they know you're there so they come ask you questions. That could be yeah, a I mean, positive thing. Where do well. they, where do these guys gather? And I, I still think it's a, it's a viable unit. Farmers and ranchers gather, in, especially in these farming communities, they go to one location for a period of time and it may be 6.30 or 7 in the morning. No, it's not at 8 when you get the office. Hell, they're already in the field working. And I told the guys in Haskell that where I go and do my morning, I go to the cafe at 6.30 in the morning if I want to go see the guys, you know. And I said, you need to go there, take some time and go there before you go to the office and find out what's going on. If you wait until 8 o'clock to go there, they're done gone. You know, go there at 6.30. Get out of bed a little early, go down there, 
buy some coffee, you know, buy your coffee and chow the fat with them because they'll start talking to you. That's what we used to do all the time. Go early, catch them. But eating none of our, and, and that's probably one of the biggest fallacies too is the people like me, and I say that, I'm taking a little uh, ego trip here, like me that train people to do that are not there anymore to train them. Mm. I mean, our people, the DCs and stuff, hadn't been trained. Even the ones now that have been here for a few years haven't been trained to work with the farmers like that. There's some generation gap there, I guess. There's a gap. Yeah. <clears throat> and it was part of the transition and our changeover too from the different agencies' names and stuff. I guess they could go back to the even the ones before you that were doing the cons the CCC camps, conservation oh, camps. Oh, yeah, yeah. Then that group trained the next generation. My oldest uh, uncle was in the CCC camps. In fact, he was in Oklahoma. He worked around the uh, Lawton area. Hmm. Yeah, I went and got his uh, records when I filed with his deal on the World War II thing. And, and it's what, yeah, he spent some time up here around the Lawton area. Well, with you, you had a mentor. Did you have someone you meant that you have mentored that keeps you know, in touch with you like you did yours? You know, I still, I still stay in touch with some of the uh, uh, people, uh, not as on a continuous basis I used to. Uh, there's, I'll mention the name Derek Kelso, who's over. I think he's over to Antlers, is a DC now. Uh, I hired Derek uh, when I was a State Con, he come over to Poto and and he just got out of uh, college and I hired him on and he uh, has worked himself up to a DC. Mm -hmm. um, I watch a lot of these kiddos on Facebook. I stay on Facebook, I don't do a whole lot of posting on it, but if I see something I think it's detrimental, I will send them a private message and I say, I don't think you need to be doing this kind of stuff. <laughs> Uh, but he sent me some stuff too and says, I'm going to apply for such What do you think I do? I said, man, go for it. Don't ever, don't ever turn around and look back. I mean, go for it. If you think you want to do it, you think you're capable of doing it, you feel you're capable of doing it, just do it. And the wife agrees. Yes. And if the wife yes. agrees. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I will never forget to talk about, I use a the word there that I don't use much anymore. I applied for a job in Puerto Rico back in, oh my gosh, 96, 97, somewhere along in there, I don't remember. And it come up and I made the top two on the, for the selecting official to look at. And the state con kept calling me, he said, I ain't heard from him, I ain't heard from him. Is there Umberto Hernandez who was the state con and he was in Puerto Rico. And he come back a month later and, and had down at the bottom my my KSAs, I always ended up my KSAs and write all this glorious stuff I'd done. I'd say down here, I said, this field, I feel this demonstrates my ability to do such and such. He took the word and circled feel and put a big deal there and said, unsure of himself. I'm supposed to put, I know I can. This demonstrates my ability. I just don't have it at all. Yeah, okay. Don't put feel in there. So I've never, I've always been careful to use the word feel. Feel. Because he, he picked that out that one time and said, unsure of himself. So just be blunt. It, this demonstrates my ability to do such and such. Sell yourself. <laughs> exactly. So it's just part of the stuff that you learn and I try to keep doing that. And I've got some people that are in the Range Society uh, that I'm still a member of, Texas and Oklahoma both, that, I get calls from and they say, hey, what do you think about this? And, you know, and just, I don't really do a mentorship as much uh, anymore, but I, I still talk to kids. Uh, my daughter-in-law is with the Texas A&M system. She does all of the interns that they're doing masters. And she brings them over to me to talk about mobility and things. In fact, she brought some over to Houston rodeo last year and had five kids. They're from all over the U.S. and. Uh, I told them about my career, my mobility, and what I did, and stuff like that. And when they were headed back to Texas A&M in the afternoon, this one girl that was there says, "You know, I was—I told you I was not going to apply or go to that interview in in Switzerland 
because I didn't want to move and said, after talking to Mr. Hilliard, I'm going to. So she went to Switzerland and took the interview. And she didn't get the job, but she was, at least she went to take the interview. And uh, I got a note back from all the kiddos and all of them said, thank you for giving us the insight about mobility. That was their big thing they picked up on. And uh, early on, I wouldn't have said that, but after I started moving and seeing the benefits, it made a difference. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. Um, well, where do you consider home? Texas or? Oh yeah, Texas is home. It's, it's been there, like I say, I was born and raised there. Um, but I've been one of these people that always, I graduated on a Sunday May of 1966, and Wednesday I left home. <laughs> I've been able to go ever since. Well, did your siblings do similar? Uh, my brother did uh, pretty much the same. My sisters never left very much. In fact, I got one sister, she moved 15 miles. That's far she's gone. She's 60, what, 61? Yeah. Well, then you have some of the, the genetics in you that brought the family to Texas to begin with. Exactly. I mean, some of that took courage. <clears throat> but, you know, like I say, I just, it's uh, the opportunities that I've been able to experience, me and my wife have been able to experience, have been, uh, I, I just can't, you know, say enough about them. And uh, I try to take as much training and that's something I tell people to do. take as much training as you can, do as much as you can. Some people say, all the things that I've done, I must be 100 years old. But, you know, I've been, I've been a plant breeder. I've been, uh, I've been a taxidermist. I had a taxidermist business for 20 years. I did, uh, you know, this, I did fishing tournaments. I fished on a circuit for 15 years on a fishing circuit, bass fishing circuit. You know, it, you just fit all these in, but I'm a person that goes on the go all the time. So do you noodle? <laughs> No, I don't know. No, I'm not that crazy. No. In fact, what I guess what bugs me the most, because I grew up on the creek banks, you know, there's a creek just down below our, our farm there. We used to shoot bullfrogs and, and uh, catch catfish in the creek, and uh, we have a, a multitude of snakes, and I'm just not going to stick my hand in nowhere, so I don't know anything's going on, because... I mean, we saw a snake last Saturday, cross, a rattlesnake cross the road last Saturday. Mm -hmm. Here it is, already been 20 degrees, you know, and the snakes are across the road. Yeah, that's... So, you never know when they're going to be there. But I'm not afraid of them. It's just I'm not going to stick my hand where I can't see anything. <laughs> well, that's, that mean, we'll ask this question too, since you did work so much. What would you do for fun or relaxation? I'm a big, uh, I hunt and fish. I'm a scuba diver. Been scuba yeah. diving. Yeah. That's that's the world you got you got to explore. It's uh, kind of like space in the last frontier. Uh -huh. um, underwater is uh, is a beautiful place to be, and so me and wife scuba dive. You wouldn't ever have imagined doing that back in high school, would you? No, no. Well, yes, I would because I always watched uh, uh, what's his name? Crusoe is what comes to mind, but that's yeah, but, right, uh, 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 oh my gosh. Um, Good God, his dad did uh, the, he was just on TV the other day. Anyway, his dad was big in doing the diving shows. Yeah, I was always intrigued by the diving. Okay. And uh, gosh, I can't believe I think what his name is. Not Kirk, yeah, Kirk, is it Kirk Douglas? No, Kirk Douglas? Yeah, what's his son's name? Uh, Michael, yeah, Kirk Douglas did, uh, did he do the uh, part of the, the diving stuff? Anyway, I was intrigued by, you know, those, those, those divers. Uh, I never even thought about doing it in the military, you know, being a SEAL or anything, because SEALs I didn't know anything about hmm. until later years. Sure, you knew how to swim at least. Uh, yeah, of course I did that through scouting. See, I'm big in scouting. I've been in scouting since I was eight years old. Okay. I teach pistol uh, shooting at, uh, for scouts and shotgun, and I do the National Scout Jamborees, which is every four years, and we'll do the World Jamboree. Uh, this next year, uh, it'll, I'll be teaching pistol to scouts from all over the world. Are you a silver be silver beaver? Silver no, beaver? I'm not a silver beaver recipient. No, no, no. And I didn't get to, that was another deal. I didn't get to make uh, Eagle Scout. Both of my boys were Eagles. I made it to Life Scout, and when I was growing up in Haskell, uh, our scout troop folded because Slumberjay 
closed down and moved and the scoutmaster was a Slumberjay employee. So it hit in that time frame that, and at that time we didn't have Lone Scout or Maverick Scout troops. Now, you, you know, a lot of times you don't have a troop, you can do Lone Scout or you can do, go through a Maverick and get in a Maverick troop where, you know, it's not uh, one troop as such. Um, but I think that is probably one of the biggest uh, Assets of the kid over from a guy's stand, a man's standpoint, a boy's standpoint is the, the scouting program and what they learn. Mm -hmm. Both my boys are eagle. What they picked up from that is something that can be on every. In fact, when my son went to work for Exxon, one of the questions are, "Are you an eagle scout?" They didn't ask me as a football captain if he was a quarterback or or anything, is, are you an Eagle Scout? That's the only thing that'll carry, you know, through adulthood that I know of mm -hmm. to an application. I mean, you learn a lot of things in Scouts. Yeah. I mean, conservation even. Exactly, even, exactly. So. Yeah, and in fact, leadership. I'm a counselor for soil water conservation, environmental science, merit badges with them, so. So you're not really retired. <laughs> you're I'm semi, retired. Semi-retired. Semi <laughs> I do what I want to do without somebody telling me what to do. There you go. Yeah, that's what retirement's about. It's an opportunity to do the things that you want to do, but I always tell somebody, always learn that two word, two letter vocabulary word, no. Mm -hmm. You have to, if you do not do that, they will they will run you ragged for volunteer work. And not that, and I do a lot of volunteer. Uh, I'm a certified uh, Stephen minister. I do caregiving, care receiving training for people. Um, I teach um, license to carry. I teach uh, school safety officers how to, to train, you know, in the school systems, in a situation. That that's 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 something that I think is worthwhile. Mm. So. Well, I'm glad you didn't say no to us coming <laughs> to, to, today. No, 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 no. I think you know, like I say, to share, you know, whatever you know. Benefit it is. It's, it's, We've covered a lot. Is there anything that I haven't that we haven't covered? Oh, I don't know. That <laughs> you to want to cover? I think. Did you have an opinion when they went from a from career when the chief switched from being a career point appointee to a to an political appointee? You know that, that that's one thing I, that I put on mind is this. I said that you know. I understand the uh, the affiliation of the, of the chief being a career appointment, but I think we've we suffered under some of our leadership, uh, especially from our, uh, uh, Lancaster and Jason Weller. The last one was that these would be career people. Jason was an OB, OMB person. Arlen was from the wildlife background. I don't think they had the agency 100% in mind. They didn't understand, I know they understood what we did, but they didn't have the inner workings of it is where we had a career person going through that, you know, to do it. Uh, even back in the days, they didn't like him, uh, but uh, God, I wouldn't like uh, the guys from up here in Henrietta. Uh, darn, he was the chief. Wilson Scaling. Wilson was a rancher from just over the cross the border here, not too far from where we're at, Henrietta, Oklahoma, uh, in Texas. And, uh, Wilson was one of these, you know, chest out, belly out, bump, bump you out of the way, and you know, very boisterous and everything. But I mean, he knew what was going on. He come from the ranch and farming background. Uh, some of these guys, uh, I think they're just ready to punch a ticket and you know, go for another deal. So, and I had some discussions with uh, when the uh, Secretary of Ag came to Oklahoma, and we went over to the Redlands and had a meeting in his. Um, Malcolm X, can't remember what the guy was, he went by Malcolm X, his front guy that came out and we set up all the security for a week and everything. He said, you know, you need to be a, a, a appointed instead of a career. I said, why? He said, so you, you know, mirror with the uh, administration. I said, I've always supported him. I said, I spent 30 years in the military and I know it was a reserve program, but it didn't matter who the general was or anything like that. I said, I always served that general. I always served the president, no matter what they're, you know, Democrat or Republican. So, but some people can't do that. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I just, you respect the office and honor the office. And, you know, Did you ever aspire to be that level, to, to be chief? 
I thought about it at one time, but then I, I look at, I don't like the contentious deal of dealing with Congress and having to go forward and testify and bring up all, because it's, uh, I know some of them guys can really be, you know, hard on you. And I just didn't want to go through that. Um, I think I'd say something and get in trouble. <laughs> I'm pretty outspoken. <laughs> get me in the corner, I'm going to come out. Yeah. Well, you've seen a lot of changes within, within conservation things. Moving forward, what do you think in the next five, ten years, do you see more? Uh, you know, I am, right now, I, I think the current trend is, is going to be, they're going to be submerging. I just, it, it's, it's just been on the horizon for a long time, but just like whenever they, they changed the, uh, under the uh, deputy secretary, and now we got uh, FSA and NRCS in the same, uh, you know, secretary it used to be four service. Now we got them. I think we're just going to start putting things together. And there again, we're going to lose a little bit of the identity, but I think we're all going to merge together. I think it's just part of the government thing that's going to happen. Well, we're seeing that in the when we're having these administrative convergence, you know, consolidations within agency right now. We're we don't even do our own selection now. It has to go up through a, another office or another level. And uh, yeah, I think eventually that's what's going to end up doing. So you came along at a good time? I think I've come on at a good time. We had some, we had some very, very fun times. Um, we did 90% of our work in the field. We did a lot of stuff. I mean, just like taking a piece of paper we had like we had conservation 67 to conservation 68, which is kind of like that form you had me fill out. Mm -hmm. That's a basically what the plan ended up being. It was just a, it was an NCR form, you know, just peel off. You, you keep the yellow copy, and we put the pink and white one here, and it goes in a plan, and you take keep this one for here, and it was a plan we literally wrote out on the hood of the truck, and we got we took credit for it. We put it into the system and, and everything like that. And shook hands and went on. We did, yeah. <laughs> And if you want to change it, you just you did what did a conservation 110, you know, revision to the plan. You did a 110, changed it, went on, took credit for it. So we, it's it was so to me it was such more simple. Um, and I understand the the computer side of it of trying to uh, account for all the monies, but I thought we had a pretty good checks and balances. It was even though it was in longhand and it was on you know long spreadsheets and stuff like that, but. We can account for all the money. Between the area clerk and the program person like I was, I mean, we knew what, where the money went to. Well, now you have to demonstrate value, don't you? Added added value or whatever the term happens exactly. to be. Exactly, yeah. I, I don't, that's another reason I went ahead and left. And, uh, and it's, it, it used to, when I, when I first started working and when I first went to, in the supervisory role, we had pretty much, you know, authority to do what we wanted to. But when I left as a state conservationist, no matter who I hired, hire, I had to send it through Washington, D.C. to make sure I'd hit all the ethnicities, I'd hit all the I's, I's and T's and all that stuff. And, and they'd come back and say, well, why don't you see if you can get some Asian Pacifics? I said, if they want to apply the first time, you need to re-advertise so if you can get somebody. You know, back then, if they didn't apply, they didn't apply. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I'm not going to go out and twist arms, you know, yeah. because that's like preferential treatment to me. So that was another reason that I was ready to to go. And you've been busy ever since. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I had thirty. I had thirty six and a half years of straight time, and you know, everybody said you need to go to forty. Uh, I probably pull my hair out at forty. You would have moved one more time, probably. I would have moved one more time. Maybe back to Texas or something. Well, I tried. I tried for the state con job in Texas. That was one of the last ones that I put in for. And didn't get, or obviously didn't get, or? No, I didn't get. It was a, there was a, another chief up there that didn't quite see. He and I didn't quite see eye to eye. I mean, he see. was a, they wiped me, never did get along. Well, seniority didn't come into play at that, that, that for that job? Uh, 
ethnicity play role. Okay. Yeah. Welcome to the new world. <laughs> Welcome to the new world. And you know, I can understand it. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't fault it in any way. It, you know, I, I've competed and I've worked with and I have great friends that are, that are sharp as a tack and there's some that get out there and just, I'm sorry. Well, you've preserved the perception of the agency th through mending these troubled areas along the way too. That's, like. that's one of the things I think I have a gift for is to work with people. Um, I, I hope that when my whole time in Oklahoma is that uh, I was there that I hope that I was inclusive for everybody and try to, uh, I know one of the first things when I come in to Oklahoma was, which was different, they said, we'd have our staff meeting, they'd have me sit up at the front and say, okay, you run the staff meeting. I said, no. I said, we're gonna rotate the staff meeting, but you know, from everybody here. So I had all of the principal staff each month had an assignment to do the staff meeting, they run it. I just sat out in the audience and, you know, to do that. I didn't want to be perceived as, you know, the hierarchy sitting up there, you know, and overpowering everybody else. And it's kind of the way I see some of these guys doing it. I don't like that. More of a team, team effort. Yeah. I may not agree, but I will try to listen. <laughs> we, we'll argue through it, hopefully. Uh, but uh, if I can see a way around it. And that's the thing about, uh, I'm a big proponent of, getting people from outside the agency, outside the, the comfort zone, not hiring people from all in, within state, get some from other states so you can get some new ideas, okay. or get some people who've seen some things differently. And like I say, living in you know the different places, I've, nobody does it the same. We're the same organization, but nobody does it the same, so there are some different ways to do things. One way not work, figure out another. Exactly. Yeah. Or, you know, try it. If it doesn't, go for it. Try it back, you know, switch it back. Switch it. Make it work for you. All right. So if nothing else, I'll ask my last question. Okay. How do you want to be remembered? How do you want people to remember Ron Hillier? <laughs> uh, is, you know, as a, I think as a person that... Uh, um, I was always conservation oriented, uh, to work with people, to attain the goal. I was always trained to, uh, to deliver the conservation to the people through the soil and water conservation districts that exist in every one of the counties. And I hope that that's what that I did when I was here as the state conservationist and the other state conservationist positions I had from there was that to, to make sure that we preserve the land for our generations, and everybody work together to get that job done. I, had, I would add one more thing. You never forgot where you came from. Exactly, exactly. From. Yeah, I never will forget Dick. Dick was, Dick Hagelstein was uh, one of the greatest guys I've ever seen, you know? And somebody said, well, he's just a district conservationist. It doesn't make any difference. My dad was just 11th grade education, but I guarantee you, he could take a string of numbers and add them up quicker than you could put them on a calculator. He's had a knack for it. So it doesn't, doesn't mean a whole lot. No, it seems like you had a knack for, you've landed in the right space, place for your, <laughs> for your talent too. So thank you for coming today. Well, thank you. I enjoyed it.